Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Um, before we get to today's uh, lecture, I've uh, got a couple of uh, things to, uh, to deal with. Uh, first off, the winners of the Ripcord uh, Chargers from Peter Evans' competition. If you remember, he challenged you to explain why the Segway, Pets.com, and the Newton had failed. And uh, I think if you remember from his uh, last week's lecture, he had forgotten that those in the education system tend to submit um, um, their homework at the absolute last possible minute. And so it's taken him a while. There were many submissions, and I have read some of them. Uh, boy, uh, you guys um, either don't have lives or really took this seriously. And I prefer to think that you took it seriously because there were some really thoughtful, excellent uh, submissions. Anyhow, we had to uh, get it down to three winners. And those three winners were Olivia Ye, Vincent Chung, and Ryan, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this right, Coelho. And just so you know what you're winning, this is the uh, Yogan Charger for Life. Uh, and, and see Peter to uh, pick up your prizes. So, um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about briefly is um, the Upstart uh, competition and your submissions. This is just a reminder, and this is true in anything you do with submissions. Please put your name on the submission itself. If there are three of you on a team, please put all three names on the submission and put the phone number and email address, do it for all three, or if you want to channel it through one person, put that just for that one person. But um, this has happened last year. People send the email in, and of course I got an email address, but there's nothing on the three-pager to indicate who it's from. There's not even a title. And so when I strip that off the email and try and circulate it, we end up not having the foggiest clue who has submitted what. And then someone from the team whose name was not on the original email tries to contact us and say there's something they like to change. Uh, so I am now carrying this for those of you who do not behave properly, okay? Just, and you know, if you're trying to raise money, it really helps if they know who is attached to that brilliant proposal. Enough said. I'm going to ask Ilse Ternik, our CEO from Mars, to come and introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. We better all watch out for uh, Tony with a stick. Um, he looks very uh, benign, but you never know. Um, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Lisa Torchman, who's going to uh, uh, speak with us uh, about Beyond the Buzz. And um, Lisa joined our uh, social innovation team before it really even existed as a program. So she came at the very nascent stages um, more than three years ago uh, to Mars when we were just beginning to really build our social innovation practice. And she's really been involved in the evolution of that practice right from the beginning. Um, but last year, she sort of took that whole um, program up a big notch when she led uh, what became Net Change Week in Toronto, uh, which not only was a massive logistical exercise with over 70 partners, uh, 14 major events across uh, the city in different venues, all different formats. Um, so, so that in itself was an enormous uh, process to not just conceive but, but uh, execute. Uh, but in the process, she really set a new standard for uh, testing the boundaries of, of uh, social networks and making them um, actually work um, to uh, bridge that gap between uh, um, tech for social change. So um, in that process, I think Lisa really uh, built a, a kind of a, uh, almost a personal uh, brand as a new emerging leader in this space, and that's been picked up. So we're very fortunate that she's going to speak to us tonight. 
Um, before coming to Mars, Lisa worked at the social, mar social marketing agency Manifest Communications, where she worked in a much more client-focused context um, with um, entrepreneurs and, and change makers. Uh, she also, while she was a student at McGill, uh, English major with uh, cultural studies on the side, um, worked at the J.W. Uh, McConnell Family Foundation, which is uh, Canada's oldest, oldest uh, family foundation that has really invested over many, many years in building some of the uh, truly remarkable social entrepreneurs. So. Uh, Lisa is also very active in the Toronto arts and broader community. She works with Luminato. She works with the Kuchiching Institute for Public Policy. Um, she's one of the Toronto City Summit Alliance uh, Emerging Leaders Network members and, and uh, on the planning committee of that. Um, so at heart, she's a tremendous city builder and very deeply engaged in the community. Uh, putting, stepping back and putting that in the context of Mars, I have to say, Lisa is part of a cohort of young people who work at Mars uh, that I personally are incredibly proud of. They are going to run the world, and uh, those of us of a certain age better watch out. So please join me in welcoming Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Wow, running the world. That's a big one. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, as Ilsa said, my talk tonight is called Beyond the Buzz. And I know that the frame that you read online was all about communicating effectively in the 21st century and, uh, and new media. But to be more focused, new media is a very large category. To be more focused, I've chosen tonight to talk to you about the social web. And more than that, how are we leveraging the social web? So first off, an introduction, why are we here today? Well, as Ilsa explained, my name is Lisa. And I'm just going to go over a few points just so you know why I've decided to come at tonight's talk in the way that I have. So I am with the Social Innovation Generation team, and we help social entrepreneurs. So my particular area with social technology and a focus on communications is helping social entrepreneurs understand how they can best communicate what they do. And most of the time, that's pretty complex. So what I can bring to bear on that situation is the fact that I have a social marketing background where we actually help clients message issues rather than products. And further going back at McGill, I studied cultural studies, a big amorphous major, um, more focused, it's called semiotics. And this is basically how we make meaning, how we imbue things, messages, symbols, references, and then how we spread those meanings and then how those things are transferred and how we extract the meaning out of them. So today's focus. The social web. I want to start with this huge caveat. I am not a social media maverick. There are a lot of people out there that call themselves social media mavens or social media experts. The best I can do is try to be a really good storyteller. I'm sure that there are a lot of you in the crowd that know more about the latest app than I do. Um, and I just want you to know that it's not just about the tools. It's about much more than that. So getting to much more than that, I want to say there is no silver bullet. So I'm not here to tell you this is exactly what you need to do and this is how. There's no such thing as the perfect formula, which might sound frustrating, but what I do have to offer is inspiration and some stories that offer some really salient nuggets. So I'm going to be covering a little bit of tools, a little bit of tactics, a whole lot of strategy, and discuss that there are a lot of different ways right now using the social web to create impact like never before. So nice to meet you, Ent101 audience. This is the first time that I'm presenting to you. And from what I understand, you are all coming from a multitude of academic disciplinary backgrounds and, and certainly work backgrounds. You're interested in entrepreneurship for a variety of reasons, whether that's starting up a company, a nonprofit, a campaign, an initiative, an event. But for some reason, you're all here today to find out about how to communicate effectively in the 21st century. 
And what I have to understand and appreciate is that when it comes to this topic, we're all at different levels. So what I want to start by doing is take a little bit of a step back and set the scene for us. So what is this new communications paradigm that we're in? Well, this is where we started. Industrial or broadcast media. That was the model of yesteryear. This is really the we tell you. This is the very controlled, very centralized, massive media conglomerate. This is Rogers. Television, radio, newspaper. The messages are very controlled. It's linked to politics, money, power. So, did that bode well for us? Ah, for a certain amount of time. But then we started to demand more. We said, listen, it's not enough for you to be telling us all the time. We have something to say about this. There became a huge shift in our expectations. One of the reasons why we shifted our expectations was the advent of the World Wide Web. That led to a paradigm called the interactive paradigm of communications. So this is really sort of a softening up of the channels. This is where the big media guys started to create feedback loops, asking us for our feedback on what they're saying. But it's still very much a, hey, how about you tell us what you think about what we tell you? So it's still very much a, this is our turf, come play on our turf if you so choose. And if you don't, we don't want to hear what you have to say anyways. Well, the other thing about this interactive paradigm is that it opened the floodgates for information. Everybody thought that they had to be online. And what we saw was a proliferation of what we call the brochure website, where everyone is brain dumping everybody. So you're getting so much information and it becomes a little bit overwhelming. So why do we need a new paradigm? Well, www dot created essentially an information overload. And that was the driver of change in this case. So we became so inundated with information that we said, okay, this isn't working for us. We have to sort of rein it in and understand how we can create a new system that operates better for us. So we've become more complex. Our systems need to catch up. Hence, the social paradigm. This is really the talk amongst yourselves. And by social, I mean this is everything you think it is. It's community, it's co-created, it's collaboration. This is really becoming, this is where media has become more open. Are you overwhelmed by social media? A lot of people are because the first thing that might come to mind is social media applications. Should I be on Twitter? Should I be on Facebook? Should I be on Flickr? Should I be on Vimeo? Should I be on, should I be going to, to Hootsuite? Should I, should I do this? Should I do this? Should I do this? And once you get used to it, and wow, I'm operating eight different systems, well, oh my goodness, tomorrow there's going to be 10 new ones. So it's really not a matter of being overwhelmed by the tools. Nobody should be everywhere, ever. It has to be strategic. And this is not a strategy. So a lot of people have a tendency when they get overwhelmed to suffer from paralysis, right? It's like, oh my goodness, this is so beyond me and I'm not even comfortable using my computer anyway, so please just keep it to email. However, you put your head in the sand, you're missing out on a huge opportunity. And the opportunity is what I'm gonna chat about more today. But a lot of people are easy to dismiss this as a generational thing. Well, it's not. And if you think about it in terms of those reductionist approaches, then you're missing out on something quite huge. So the social web today is actually defined as how people socialize or interact with each other throughout the World Wide Web. So if you can see this, I know there's a lot on here, but this is basically an example of how much the conversation has diversified. So there are two groupings of what we call Web 2.0 technologies. They're either people-focused or they're hobby-focused. And the entire gamut of them are interested in interaction and community. So essentially, 
everything you see here, whether it's video aggregation, documents, places to hear about events, music, wikis, live casting, pictures, social bookmarks, all of these are different areas to interact, to get information, to share information, to spread information. And it's done so in a completely fragmented, specialized way. So this, the social web is actually the creation of how we needed to better organize our information. So you might be asking, okay, well, you know, has information really changed? Can information actually change? Like how much can information change? Well, consider the following. Because we've decentralized our information systems, they've become a lot more intuitive. So what this means is because things have broken off into each, into their own categories, they've tagged their certain specifications and they've made it searchable, you can actually get information that's way more meaningful to you than ever before. And these channels are way more sophisticated than we've ever had before. Democratized. So if you think about this in terms of control, the big media gurus from before, they had all kinds of control. And that's because the centralized control is all about controlling something physical. And when you have a world in atoms, and it's something physical to control, that's pretty easy to understand how you're gonna control it. What happens when the world turns to bits? Harder to control. So this is a huge issue with the social web. Should information be controlled? And if so, who should be controlling it? Is it up to the government? Is it up to our schools? Is it up to our workplaces? So this is a really big debate. But essentially what you have to know is that there are more voices out there, so it's not just one to many, it's many to many. So that's what we mean by democratized. Valuable. So I'm sure that many of you heard of Matthew Ingram. He, he has recently left uh, the Globe and Mail as a staffer. He is a technology, business, and web writer and a prolific blogger. And he said in one of his talks, he said, you know, we've essentially made information more valuable. We've made it more valuable because it's linkable. So he said we've created essentially what's called a link economy. Making things linkable has changed the face of media, the way information can be searched, and how we value it. So he said, you know, think about that for a second. If you are reading your newspaper and there are, you know, 10 examples given in one article, well, if something is of interest, then you have to go close your newspaper, maybe go to the library, or, you know, then Google it. The fact is, is that you can't have a more in-depth search using that kind of medium. So online, by making things linkable, you're able to search things at much more depth than ever before, therefore making information more valuable. Open, here's a concept that a lot of people are talking about. So this is all around how we've changed our expectations. By nature of information becoming instantaneous and so accessible, we're demanding more openness from people. We're demanding our companies, our systems that govern us, our public services, we're demanding that they be more open. And really what this means is be more authentic, be more transparent. How about sharing? Well, sharing's not enough. What if you collaborate? God forbid you might actually start to co-create or let us Remix, and some of these are definitely lingo for this space, so I'm gonna explain them more further in the presentation. Viral, also a word that you might have heard of. YouTube's really good at making things go viral. So this is really the thinking that never before has information been so easy to copy. We can replicate, we can share, we can spread. We can proliferate in an instant. Measurable. So it's not like information has never before been measurable, but now it's to a hyper degree. So you can actually measure the impact of what you put out there in real time. And not only that, but you can measure 
how people are reacting to what you're putting out there in real time and, and what they're doing with the information you're putting out there. So for marketers, for anyone who's putting out a message, that is highly valuable information. So what does this all mean? Well, I want to say that basically for the first time, it's as if we really do have the world at our fingertips, right? So is that an opportunity that we can just pass by because we're not really comfortable with the new lingo or the new hardware, whatever it might be? I don't think so. That's a pretty big one. So what do I want to do now? This is my favorite part of the presentation. It's all about storytelling. I want to show you guys some case studies of how people are actually leveraging the power of the social web. And by no means do I want you to take away from this, this is what you should do. Because these are pretty big examples. But what I want to do is I want to create A, inspiration, and B, I want you to glean certain nuggets out of certain things. And I'll sort of take you through it as we narrate this. So first up, how many people, show of hands, have heard of 350 or recognize this logo? Come on, Canada. <laughs> so this was a, a global campaign. It was 350.org was an organization created to create an international movement around climate change before the talks in Copenhagen. So basically this organization said, we want the entire world, or people who care around the world about climate change, to be able to directly pressure their leaders who are going to be making some pretty hefty decisions in Copenhagen. Okay, well, that's a pretty big task, right? How do we affect change globally in a matter of months before a huge worldwide meeting? Well, Okay, they started an organization. It was, it was basically people around the world in different offices, so decentralized. They created an online hub. They created an online hub that was basically all of the frameworks and the tools that people would need to create their own campaigns for themselves. So this is what we call people-powered. They made the entire campaign people-powered. They said, we by no means have the ability to have enough momentum here with just you know, our home base team to affect that much change. It's going to have to rest with the people. So they made it open source. Well, the thing about 350 that you also have to know, why the heck did they brand it 350? It's not really meaningful if you don't really know what it's about. But it's really easy to know what it's about once you know what it's about. 350 is a scientific number. It's the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's actually a safe level for our planet. Anything over that, we're overheating. So they basically pared that message down very simply. If you want to know more about it, we can show you the science. 350 is also a number. So globally, I mean, it transcends language, it transcends nationality, it transcends border, race, religion. It's a number, very easy to spread. 350 itself is a kernel, and it was also the entire story. What they did, the Step It Up team, or sorry, the, the uh, 350 team, they basically said, okay, so we're not, gonna, we're not gonna assume that people know how to rally. I mean, it's like making, you know, it's like saying, hey, can you be an activist in two seconds? Thanks, perfect. Um, that's just not gonna happen. So what they did was they created free toolkits on how, how to have an actionable offline. And they posted that on YouTube, and that became viral. So if you need help to understand what we mean by acting offline once you care about this message, there are umpteen ways that we have set up to help you. And it was pretty cheap for them to do it that way. So I'm just going to show you the website, if we can go to their website.
And I also want you guys to think about when, when we're on this website, how many times you see 350? So this is, in terms of brand consistency, an amazing example. So if we scroll, oh, go up a little bit, sorry. If we scroll down this side, so here are all the sort of pictures, what they put, what they centered the website on. This is the hub, right? So they said, anything that you do out in the world, all we need you to do is put 350 in the image and send it back to us so that we can actually look like a concerted movement. So just if we scroll down along the side, you can see how many ways you can be involved. Here's the buzz on Twitter. Here's the science of 350. You don't get it? Well, we're here. We're already overheating. We're at 387. We need to be here. You can click for more information if you want to get more scientific. Featured updates, you know, if you want to know where this is, how this is going, what happened in Copenhagen. What if you want to take some pictures? What if you want to use Flickr? Well, you can click there. It makes it easy. Here are our friends and allies if you want to know who else is supporting us. If you want to send us a video, click here. It really gave people the easy button. Again, understanding 350, 350 messengers. They could have had 1,000 messengers, but no, they wanted to stick to brand. And if you could see from back there, you know, this is Van Jones, David Suzuki, Bill McGibbon, uh, Desmond Tutu. They had pretty high-level allies on their side. Okay, so if we go back to their, to the presentation. Thank you. So one thing that they did have, you know, I, when I used the 350 campaign in another presentation, someone asked me, well, pff, to affect that much change that quickly, they must have had millions of dollars. I said, actually, they didn't at all. But they did have a precedent. So I'm not going to get into it too much today, but um, if you guys are interested, you could look up stepitup.org, which was a campaign launched in 2007. And that was specifically for the states before the pre presidential, presidential elections, also having to do with climate change. There was a story that, I mean, this story is really amazing. Four students who had just graduated came together because they wanted to affect change. They had one ally and a professor, Bill McGibbon, and zero budget. And so they said, wow, if we could affect that much change with Step It Up, let's step it up another notch and create the second generation campaign, make it international, hence 350. CNN called it the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history. That's huge. So they said the world needs to know. Did the world think the world needed to know? Well, how did the world respond? There were 181 countries that responded. And in those countries, 5,200 unique events were launched on the ground. And remember I said, you know, all they wanted you to do was to give it back to them so that they could digitally archive it and they could show how it looks as a whole movement? Well, this is what it looks like. So we're just going to show you the video. Ooh. <laughs> do, do, do. So here's how the world responded. Click anywhere. People around the world are using today as a day of action in fighting climate change. Hundreds of environment campaigners gathered in Edinburgh today.
I love that video. That was a good video, right? Pretty inspiring, pretty powerful. That would have been impossible to do in that amount of time without the networks provided by the social web. So huge response. Um, here's a campaign that I think probably more of you have heard of, the Obama campaign. So interesting here, obviously, is how he used the social web for politics. Um, you know, things that might come to mind, why you would want to use the social web. You know, obviously, you want to sort of create a community of supporters. You want another way that you can reach them and talk to them. The other big thing, you want to raise a ton of money. So Obama's team figured, OK, well, McCain, McCain's going to have the traditional strategy. He's going to do outreach to very high net worth individuals and ask them for a lot of money. Obama's team said, what if we asked people for less money but asked more people? So this was a strategy of hyper-segmentation. They actually wanted to understand how more people could give them money. That's not the only thing they wanted to understand, but that was just a nugget from, from this campaign. So what did they do? They created MIBO. My Barack Obama became the answer to hyper-segmenting the audience. This is what it looks like. This is the MIBO interface because it's all about you. It's all about the individual. So by making it hyper-segmented, what they were able to do was they were able to glean such detailed information about who was using MIBO that they were then able to put back information to the, give them information back that was more meaningful to them basically making it a more personal campaign for each of his supporters. That's amazing, right? The more personal a campaign can be for you, that's pretty good. I'd buy into that. So if you were having any trouble figuring out how to use MIBO, well, this is Amy. She's working specifically on the MIBO team. This is her in her office. And on YouTube, she can give you a tour for free. Anything you want to know about how MIBO functions, don't worry, because Amy is there to be your guide and to show you. And this particular video got over 100,000 views. So, you know, some people were definitely making use out of it. There was also Nicole. There was also James. Nicole would tell you how, with MIBO, if you really wanted to, to be actionable, how you could do a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor canvassing. James would tell you how to do personal fundraising. So in each of these strategies, you know, obviously, you don't want to just have an online strategy where you get people to come online, get all excited about it, and then do nothing. It's always how to affect change offline. So they, again, theme of the easy button, gave everybody the easy button and said, you know, these are things, these are the desired results, right? These are what we want you guys to do, and this is why. And we're going to make it incredibly easy for you guys to do it. And so the other thing is, I mean, hope, action, change, those words definitely resonated with, with the American public. But it wasn't just about that. So you can't just rely on a really strong brand and a really strong message. Some people still need incentives. So one of the interesting things that the Obama team did was that they said, you know what? The more you engage, the more we'll give you. The people that were at the highest level of activity, which the MIBO team can track, actually got SMS text messages sent to their phones on latest updates before mainstream media got them. If people elected to get, you know, they, they said, oh, I want to know what events are going on in my area, they got those local events sent to them. 
So it was incredibly smart and incredibly intuitive. At the end of the day, what does this net out to? Well, I mean, he was elected president, but the campaign, I mean, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. The campaign raised $745 million, over double what McCain's campaign raised. And maybe more pointed to this discussion, the fact is, is that 33% of that was raised offline and 67% of that was raised online. Huge numbers there. Green my apple. This is kind of an outdated example if you consider 2007 to be outdated. But I absolutely love this example so much because it's an interesting branding example. So does anybody know where Green, or who Green My Apple, who invented Green My Apple, where it came from? Just put up your hand if you know. One person. This was a really sneaky campaign. This was actually a campaign launched by Greenpeace. The point of this campaign was to pressure Steve Jobs to stop using toxins in his electronics and in his computers. The thing about it is that, is Steve Jobs gonna listen to a scrappy environmental activist organization? Probably not. Is he gonna listen to his gung-ho Mac users? I think so. So what Greenpeace did was that they completely took themselves out of the picture and created a campaign that mimicked the Apple brand to pressure Steve Jobs. And they said, who's stronger to be an environmental activist than the Mac user themselves? So why don't we just create the platform that they and create the open channel where they can directly pressure Steve Jobs to green the Apple? This was so successful, successful that from launch to finish, it took nine months for the team at Apple to create a greener Apple and to actually get up on stage and Steve Jobs did his PR thing. He said, wow, we've heard you, I've heard you. I'm going to create the greener Apple. So let's look at this a little bit. So this is an example of, well, this is a screenshot of their homepage, which is now archived because the job was done, but it's still such a good example that they've kept it up there. So, you know, it mimics the Apple brand through and through. You know, if you want to know more about stuff, like eye poison and eye waste, you can go there. Um, you know, I love my iPod, but, but how come it's so toxic? So there's information there. Take action. There's a number of things. There's a number of ways here. And then view the best procreation. So, so we're going to sort of see how brand remix really played in this one. Procreate your own, so help us make Apple green. This again, Greenpeace is also doing you know, 50 other things at the same time that they launched this campaign. So they said this really has to be people powered. We really need to give people the easy button here. So what they said, what they did was they made all of the, all of the pieces of the brand available for people who bought in to go grab it and remix it as they would. And they gave them instructions on how to do this. So here, design a, a campaign t-shirt. Make a new Apple advert. Make your own commercial. Create a new poster. This one is you know, obviously a, a spin off the, the iPod where they're sort of moving and it's all shadowed. So one of the most watched commercials was this um, a Mac World Address in 2007 that was actually a keynote given by Steve Jobs and someone dubbed his entire speech and made it all about how he made the green, greener apple before he actually said that he was going to do the greener apple, which was really funny. So that got about 160,000 views. But this one is, I, I find this one really funny. If we can go to the brand remix link there. Thank you guys have probably all seen this commercial, understand the spoof here. Hi, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. And you know, we're a lot alike these days. 80 gigabyte hard drive. 1 gigabyte RAM. DVD-ROM drive. 17 inch screen. Cadmium. Beryllium. Lead. Brominated flame retardants. Hexavalent chromium. Phthalates. Mercury. Cousins under the skin. My brother from another mother. 
good, good times. So that was made by an Apple consumer who was just really upset that, you know, they, how are we supposed to really know what's really, you know, in our technology? Well, maybe that's the job of our environmental organizations, who knows? But the fact is, is that enough people cared that enough pressure got to Steve Jobs that in nine months the announcement was made. Um, just another example of how personal this got. So this was um, an ad made by someone named Brian. So if we can go click on that link, I think it's actually going to redirect us. So it goes to a Flickr account. This person named Brian decided to create um, an iPod branded, remixed poster for the Green My Apple campaign and posted it on Flickr. And then if we just scroll down here, he says, I made this from a real iPod ad for the Green My Apple campaign. Here's the link to Greenpeace to this campaign. Make something of your own. Tag it Green My Apple, add it to the Green My Apple group, and it will automatically appear at this link. And then if we scroll down on comments, we can see, you know, great, this is amazing, thank you, excellent job. Someone else made one and posted it under the comment section if we just scroll down a little bit more. Thank you, Brian. So just, I mean, this is unbelievable. It, it truly became, you know, the consumers that were the ambassadors of this campaign. So going back to the presentation. Um, what about companies? So we've looked at, you know, campaigns, snapshots in time. What about big companies that have established brands? Well, Dell, which is interesting because they're a tech company, was decidedly offline. I mean, not fully offline. Obviously, they have a website and everything, and, and, and uh, it has a certain amount of interactivity. But they're not, you know, they don't have a Facebook group or Twitter profile. And maybe, I don't want to put words into their mouths, but maybe they were doing a little bit of this. So if we're not on Twitter, maybe people won't talk about us on Twitter. So, you know, what did we say about that in terms of it not being a strategy? Wrong. Someone said Dell sucks and created a virtual firestorm. And it wasn't just anybody that says Dell sucks. It happened to be Jeff Jarvis. Jeff Jarvis, the author of What Would Google Do? A very influential book. He is also a prolific blogger. He runs the Buzz Machine and has a huge following. What happened here was he basically complained about Dell products and created such a snowball effect, opened the channels of conversation, and people were like, hey, yeah, I see what you mean. That does suck. If you Google Jeff Jarvis, comma, Dell, results, this is one of 10 of about 77,000 results. So this created a massive media storm. And why was it so massive? Because Dell wasn't part of the conversation. They weren't there to be able to say, oops, OK, this is what we're going to do about this. This is how we're going to address this. The good thing for Dell, thank goodness, is that they woke up and they said, you know, this is something that we need to do. We need to get online in a better way. How can we best service the community? Because clearly, we have a huge following, a huge customer base that are all online. And you know they might be talking badly about us right now because this one product, but at least they're talking about us. So our customers care. So now, how can we leverage that? What they created was a much more interesting, much more interactive website. You can go up here and you can look at blogs. It goes directly to Dell. They have videos. This is, this is their video um, suite called Studio Dell. If you need any kind of help whatsoever, don't pick up the phone. Go online, watch a video, and we'll have an IT expert telling you exactly what to do, whether you're at home, a small business, whether you're an IT pro yourself. Discussion forums. So they basically didn't, o they didn't only quash that, you know, that one sort of storm, but they went up a notch. And not only did they go up a notch, they went up 10 notches. They created idea storm. So it became not only how do we best service our community, but how can we best leverage the community? 
So hey, if they're there already and they care about us so much, how can we actually ask them for their input? IdeaStorm, which is run by um, Salesforce.com, is basically a platform whereby Dell can co-create its products with its customers. So if we think about product development, you know, old model, experts are in the back room brainstorming, coming up with all kinds of amazing innovations. And by innovations, maybe sometimes that just means a minor tweak, but it looks awesome from the new packaging. Then it goes into beta testing, and it goes, you know, there's target audiences, and you never really know how it's gonna fly until it hits the market. Well, here, in this model of product development, you can actually ask the audience what they're gonna think of this idea before it's made. And this has been seen to be hugely successful for, for Dell. Starbucks did a similar thing. They used also Salesforce.com, and this is their first, um, foray into the social web, and they said, you know what? Hey, Starbucks goers, we know that you're an amazing following. Help us create the best coffee-going experience that you could possibly imagine. And if you guys have ever seen those little green sticks that hang off the side of your coffee cups to stop spillage, that was an idea that a customer gave them and actually went to market. So, are you gonna be the next case study? How can you do it? So I understand that you're not running for president or interested in creating the next global climate change campaign, but there are certain things that you should know and certain takeaways from those case studies that we should just discuss. So first of all, social web, it's all about people. You really have to understand that it's all about building the relationship and building the trust. If you want your audience to believe in you, those are two things that you need to build first. Understand how to harness people powered. Are, do you want people to be your ambassador? If so, how? Are you asking them to proliferate the campaign or are you asking them to just donate? What's the ask? Why are you even leveraging the social web? So really some upfront hairy questions for yourself. Don't feel, because this is trendy, don't be stuck in that sort of, ooh, shiny and new tools, I should have that. How ridiculous does it look, you know, say a junior employee is driving a Porsche. Clearly, they can't afford it, clearly they can't maintain it, and that's, you know, pretty transparent. And, you know, people might question that. This is the same kind of thing. Put yourself out there in an authentic way. Don't have all these bells and whistles that you're never really gonna use. Because in an open world, it's definitely easier to tell and, and, and people will catch you on it. So the other thing about brand integrity is to be consistent. All of those brands were consistent through and through. McCain's campaign kept changing, his top messages kept changing. Obama, Three words remained from beginning to end, hope, action, change. Those three words were there the entire time. Easy, are you giving people the easy button? Can people share your story? That's success right there. If people can share your story, that is very successful. And a lot of people get this wrong or, or it's hard for them to get this because we have the tendency to just brain dump. And this is what we call broccoli. Beware of this kind of broccoli. It's information overloading. And, and no one can really, you know, in the increasing noise and increasing din of messages out there, how are you gonna really be heard? So it's really about stripping down to the essence of what your message is and make it easy for people. If people wanna know more, they can always go searching for more after they get that initial nugget from you. Experiment, get creative. Never before have you been able to create a campaign or to create your communication strategy and test it out like you can now. You know, I come from a marketing agency. There are campaigns that are created out in the world that are easily tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to create and put out into the world. By using these tools, you can test out bits and pieces of it. You don't have to have the entire thing rare and to go. And, and definitely, I would recommend testing it, actually, before you go out with everything. 
Uh, one important thing too is that old tricks definitely still work. So you know, put incentives out there. Competitions still work. Those are huge online draws. And storytelling, although that may be the oldest tool in the book, it's probably the most useful. And then know how to measure what you put out there. So you know, don't just think that. Oop, you know, I'm not just thinking right now that anything that I've told you today, you know, maybe it's going to spread by word of mouth, but I'm also aware that it's being filmed and that it's going to go up on the Mars site. And I'm not sure how big it's then going to proliferate. So that's big, right? I need to understand what impact am I having? I've put my foot out there. Now what's the ripple effect? How can I measure that? And remember, there is no silver bullet. There is not one formula. Things change, so be prepared to be creative. And you know the sort of if you build it, they will come analogy from Field of Dreams doesn't apply here. So sorry, Kevin Costner. Um, if you build it, they might not come. So understand that you can't just put stuff out there. People are really busy. You need to understand where your audience is, join the conversation, and understand how you get them back to where you want them to be. Also, do you want them to keep coming back? So longevity is another question. Where to start? Read, follow, attend, inspire. You know, this is going to be made available after, so I'm just going to kind of flow through it really quickly, but there are a lot of books that you could read about this stuff. Um, and some of them more critical. I'm not saying that this is, you know, the best thing ever. There's a lot of things that are to be critiqued about this. Um, some idea leaders, you know, follow idea leaders on Twitter and listen to what they're saying. I'm not saying that, you know, get out there, be part of the conversation right away if you're not comfortable doing so. But certainly, you know, bit by bit, you can sort of get an understanding of what these people are really talking about. So here are some examples, Clay Shirky, Jeff Jarvis, Beth Cantor, Jay Goldman, Don Tapscott, they're all coming at it from unique perspectives as well. There are a ton of free resources out there. Get into SlideShare, put in social web, whatever you want, social tech, social media. There you go. Hundreds of slides you can read, hundreds of presentations that you can get ideas from. Attend web-enabled events. So Toronto is hopping with web-enabled events. We are definitely a hub of activity right now. Some of them that have gone on here, our own net change event. There's a change camp or demo camp. You know, there's these unconferences or camp style conferences that are all about using social media tools to proliferate the, the message beyond the four walls of a conference room. HoHo TO was a fundraiser that was Twitter enabled, raised an incredible amount of money, and had a completely sold out a crowd of 800 in about two weeks. Tweet ups, tune ups, stuff that's Twitter enabled, happen every week in Toronto. Inspiration download. To get you, to get you more comfortable with this kind of stuff, sometimes I say, you know, get, get together with a group of your colleagues or with a group of your friends and weekly or monthly spread an, an inspiration download. Send emails with links that are inspiring you right now. And most of all, shameless plug, come to Net Change 2010. It's happening again. It's going to be bigger and badder than last year and better. Um, it's June 7th to 11th, and we have something for everyone if you need social tech training or if you just want to hear best practices from international speakers. So it's really something for everyone. Keep your ear to the ground if you're interested. And today, today's talk wouldn't have been possible without my hearing stories from other amazing storytellers. John Warno, who is the Step It Up and 350 inspiration. Rahaf Harfouche, who was the Obama inspiration, and she wrote a book called Yes We Did. Becca Economopoulos used to be at Greenpeace, now she's with Fish and Strategy, but that was the whole Green My Apple campaign. And Jay Goldman from Ripple, who tells me all about what corporations are doing, and he's also a prolific blogger, so go check out what Jay's um, talking about. He has great stuff to say. So here's how to catch me. I hope that you guys enjoyed it and uh, got some 
critical pieces out of it, and I hope that this is just the beginning of a spark to inspiration to come. So thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering how and um, what are some resources to measuring, you know, what you're doing? Uh, blog, blog stats, Facebook, uh, Twitter, some of the more accessible tools. So there are um, applications that come with their own um, measurement indicators. So Google, for instance, um, brings back very meaningful analytics and metrics on Google applications. But basically, it's a matter of understanding, you know, how if you start using an application, there's always another application out there to measure it. So it really depends what platform you're talking about. And the best thing there is to honestly Google. Google, if you want to understand how to measure, some of them have counters. You know, like the YouTube, you could see how many views the YouTube has had. Um, others aren't that forthcoming. So if you have any questions, that's the other amazing thing. If you have questions about the social web, go to the social web. You can literally Google how to measure input application. And there will be resources out there to show you how to do that. There isn't just sort of one resource to count those analytics. That's a great question. So it's all about trust and how to trust sources. You know, when there's so many more voices out there, how do you know what they're, if they're accredited? Um, is it an expert voice? And the thing around this, it also goes back to being open, being more transparent. You should do some digging on your sources. So, you know, for instance, I mean, this is a huge debate, first of all. There are people who sort of span the spectrum. You have you know, this, this guy, Andrew Keene, who's a polemicist, and he says that the social web is making us collectively dumber because we can't discern who the experts are and who the non-experts are. And there's something called signal-to-noise ratio. And what experts want to do is to make that ratio really high. They want their signal, which is the kernel of truth, to be above, over and above, the noise that might be out there. So the stuff that might be untrue. Um, and, and in any case that where the person is to really be trusted, that signal to noise ratio will be really high. And they, their credits will be very easy to search. So when you're thinking, you know, Okay, who is this guy, Jeff Jarvis? So he, he's, okay, so he's an author of a book and he's pissed off at Dell. Well, maybe you know, a lot of people could share in his, his griping. 
He's also always on CNN. He's also, you know, speaking at um, conferences internationally. So this isn't just, you know, average Joe customer. He has a lot of um, weight behind him. Um, so what I would say to that is, you know, just because there's more information out there doesn't mean it's necessarily better. It means that we just need to be more discerning. And there's also something called crowdsourcing where you're able to, you know, look at whether this is a credible source vis-a-vis um, -vis what your peers have said. So there's like some, some sources have peer ratings and you can see if it's peer reviewed and what your peers have said about it. That's also a big thing. So, you know, maybe a restaurant critic has falsely given their friend a really good rating, but then, you know, once it goes on the blogosphere, people are like, what are you talking about? This must be some kind of relationship that you two have because it was awful and I saw a rat and whatever. So look for those peer review ratings. They're, uh, they're pretty good as well. My question is uh, taking Tony's question from the other side. So as a new entrepreneur, which I'm sure many of us are here, um, do you have any recommendations on how to establish um, trust and credibility uh, in, in the social web, because when you're starting out, you have no reputation, you have no credibility. Um, how do you go about building that uh, online so that people can trust you? So I would say for startups, this is, it's almost like revisiting Marketing 101. It is before you even think about online, you have to think about your stuff offline. And you have to ask yourself some pretty hairy questions. So, you know, and it's all about what's my domain? Who else is in that domain with you? How do I differ from those that are in my domain? And that point of difference is going to become your value add and your point of uniqueness. And so that's a nugget, right? Right there. I mean, this is essentially sort of um, branding 101 as well. Um, you should have some sense of your market and your audience before you're even online. The other thing about online is that there are things out there that you can leverage already. There are certain people online that are considered hubs. And if you have the trust of those hubs, then you pretty much have the trust of their followers too. Um, and that's, that's been a big, a big thing to drastically increase your following in a very short amount of time. So it's also your propensity to get out there. You know, meet people face to face, go to some of these events where your customers are going to be. So it's kind of like there's nothing that you should be doing online that you're not doing offline. And those are questions that you should ask yourself before even thinking, what's my online strategy? So, I'm, okay, so the first part of that was around um, an article, around, just for people who didn't hear, um, an article from The Onion, uh, and it's not something that we haven't heard before, employees being really embarrassed by their employer seeing them on Facebook. That's the first part of your no, question? Class, and then, the headline on The Onion was, yeah. classmates.com employees too embarrassed to tell their employer about Facebook. Right. Yep, Win Mobile is definitely a great example. Um, so Win Mobile basically had to battle the giants, right? They had to battle Rogers and Bell, and basically what they wanted to do was create a groundswell. I mean, I think that there's enough energy in Canada at, bef before they were even around to tap into around how you know frustrated we are with our communication services and how much control those big guys have. So what they needed to do was get strategic on how to tap into that energy and make it a collective voice. 
and basically they, they created a very authentic brand. They said, we are of the people and here's the conversation. It's all about the conversation and made that their website, their platform. They said, here's what people are asking us. Here's what we say. You know, have you ever seen the posters? It says, so-and-so says, asks this question. You know, is prepaid going to be the same as postpaid? And then three people have commented on that question. Well, winmobile.ca hits reply all, and here's our answer. And then below it says, join the conversation. So they've really done a good job of just making it totally authentic. It's all about tapping into the collective frustration that Canadians are having right now with their, with their communication distributors and providers. So yeah, they're a fantastic case study for, for an open source campaign. People powered. Okay. Hi, Lisa. Um, quick question. You mentioned crowd surfing um, originally. And I think I read an interesting, art, sorry, crowdsourcing. Sourcing, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think I read an interesting, <laughs> sorry about that. And I read an inter, interesting article with a, on the Mars site about Text Eagle as using an example. Sorry about? Text Eagle, using an example of using crowdsourcing as a business model. Now, a lot of the examples that you gave was the social web in terms of improving communication and getting people together as a community. Can you talk more maybe about the business benefits around the social web other than customer service or communication? Sure, so um, there are unbelievable resources also out there that talk about you know, how much income or how much revenue has been generated by companies going online. And really, you know, when you read the numbers, um, for some people, numbers are the strongest case. And as, well, specifically for entrepreneurs and startups who, you know, you don't want to just sort of put resources out there and then not get anything back, right? So um, to your question about crowdsourcing and different business models, So the social web is really just one platform, right? So you talked about SMS. There are, right, I mean, it's, it's basically one, one platform. Some companies will say in their strategy they only want that platform. Others want to make it multi-platform. So, you know, how can people grab this message? Or how can someone who's online send this to someone in SMS or something like that? Um, how can these platforms speak to each other? And you get, you know, the fact is is that companies are now getting more creative with their business models because there is such an openness and there's so many different ways to be creative. Um, and there are a plethora, like I'll talk to you later about some resources um, that are available, but there's a plethora. If you search um, open source business models, um, someone out of Carleton University, Tony Bailetti, writes specifically about this. And a good resource is also the open source business resource. And they talk about that as well. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for your uh, great presentation. Um, I'm curious to know, like you mentioned, there's a lot of strategies you can take for social marketing. And there's no silver bullet. But now for your um, net change week, I'm curious to know what sort of the general strategy you've taken uh, to uh, get it on the social web? Ha ha, turning it on me. Um, well, it's interesting. The, the first thing was that, um, just I'll, I'll, I'll start with this caveat, is that um, last year, so, so 2009 is gonna look a heck of a lot different well, than this year. Is, so 2010 and 2009 are two different stories. Um, in the first year, Net Change was actually supposed to be a citywide multi-location event. And as enablers, so people at Mars who create programming for people to partake in, we're by no means the only people that, that do that. We have other unbelievable organizations in our midst, and some of them are our partners. Um, but they're also creating programming. And when it comes to this whole social tech space, we can't purport to think that we're the only ones doing it. So what we wanted to do was say, 
you know what, there's a lot of talk around this. We're seeing a lot of overlap. We're not talking to each other, which is kind of ironic because it's all about having easier, an easier ability to communicate with one another. Um, and we're burning through resources by getting the same speakers in. We have overlapping audiences. Um, so what can we do? So the thinking was we could create a frame and say this is going to be an experiment. We are going to explore the intersection between social tech and social change. And as long as you have those two components, feel free to design your own event because we understand that you're coming with your own audiences. What ended up happening was we got huge buy-in, but we also got the request that, hey, you have a cooler space than we do. Can we just throw our event at Mars? So what ended up happening was what was supposed to be a multi-location event became a Mars-driven event. There were two events at the Gladstone, but essentially all of the events happened at Mars, which ended up being pretty neat because you, that way you got to see, you know, there were 2,000 people that came through. You actually got to capture all of that in one place. And what we did, because this was a very, we had no precedent, it was very sort of bumbling and naive, um, we said, you know, who, who's, gonna, who's gonna bite? We got online, so there were four people in the core team. All of us have Twitter accounts. And right from the beginning, we said, instead of saying, hey, here's net change 2009, it's gonna happen in June, the first communique that went out there was, hey, we're thinking about throwing this thing in June, can you help us name it? It's around social tech and social change. Here are our top five ideas that we generated, but can you please feel free to generate your own ideas and then vote and talk amongst yourselves? So from the very get-go, it was a completely open strategy and we needed, we said, wow, you know, this is kind of a, a hairy event to sell. Like, social tech for social change, exploring intersections, like that's not, in terms of having that negative communication, we probably should have worked that through a little bit more and that's why it's gonna be different in 2010. But it was all about involving the community from the get-go and making them design the event that was most helpful to them. So from the first communication, hey, hey community, can you give us your feedback? And we kept throughout doing that. We had, an, we had a, an art show, and 24 hours before we launched the event, we held a 24-hour art competition submission. Sorry, 48 hours before the event. And, you know, the thing is about this fast-moving world, sometimes putting it out there like, hey, you only have this amount of time, it really bolsters people to act. So, you know, again, it was... A, a double-pronged strategy. It was not only do we want to tell people that there's going to be an art show here, but we want to say, hey, and if you have stuff that you want to show us, please send it back to us. And we're going to make it a competition so only one of you gets to actually um, have their art displayed in the atrium for an entire week. And we had about 30 pieces we curated, and that one piece was the winner and they had their art here for a week. It was pretty amazing. And uh, it was kind of mutual love too because they blogged about the experience. Hey, my art was in Mars and we blogged about them blogging. It was, it was a big sort of love in in the end. But yeah, we got really close to the community. Yeah. And sorry, one more thing. We also did offline strategy. So we did a net change drink up. Once we actually had enough uh, community online following us, we said, hey, come meet the team. and ask us any questions you might have. So that was after you, know, you do your sort of critical, critical path, your work back, and we said, after about a month, we should probably have enough followers to actually host an offline event, give a face to the, to the event. Hi, Lisa. Uh, not to generalize, but just uh, from the observations of your, your examples, it seems that most of the, of the successful campaigns were generated from disgust or hate of a certain situation, a product, that sort of thing, and which solicits a lot of passion amongst uh, the people involved with having to use a certain product or being, you know, in a certain um, political system, whatever it has been. But if you're trying to compete uh, to sell a product, let's say, against 
a, a product that is already solicits a lot of well-being, you can't get that, that feedback, that groundswell. So how would you be able to use the social network to get people to respond and say, yeah, that, you know, uh, I like company X's product, mm -hmm. so, but company Y's is unproven, it's new, but it'll save you some bucks. It doesn't solicit that same passion. So can you use the, uh, the social net for that kind of leverage, that kind of advantage to, well, put, to promote your product? I would say, you know, again, this speaks to the, what you've got going on offline before you even think about online. So this, again, goes back to marketing 101. I mean, if everybody loves product X, then why create product? No, if it's, you know, let's say you're saving 20% uh, on cost, you can make it. Sure. Uh, you, know, you figure out what the unique value is, right? What, what is your, if you have someone that's very closely resembling your product or your company, you want maybe your direct attack or your direct course of action is going to be to acknowledge that and to say, you know, we're pretty similar, but you're going to save 10 bucks. Who wouldn't want to do that, right? So um, it would be about sparking the discussion around your value add. You know, it's not, it's not going to incent anybody if you say we're so close, we're kind of like this, so maybe you should just look into us. That's really lukewarm, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to sort of have the same sharp plan of attack that you would in normal marketing to market online and to harness. Um, you know, if Win Mobile were to say, we are just like Rogers, but so much better because we're cheaper, it, mm, other companies have done that. And, and Rogers will counteract and say, yeah, but we have a much better system in place. And who is this new person? So. It really depends. I mean, this is you know worth sort of brainstorming and hashing out in an, in a in a good sort of marketing like put it on the table and say what really are we messaging in terms of our brand to get people excited. Thank you. It's strategy. Can yeah. I interject? I mean, I, I, yeah. I would, would sort of draw from that an example. There's a great radio show, The Age of Persuasion, on CBC, and he. I mean. I think that's where you get creative. Um, he cited an example of, uh, I forget the name of the company, but a beer company, and their, their tagline was, we're the best-selling German beer in America. And the competition came in and basically quoted that and said, we'd like to introduce you to the best-selling German beer in Germany. So, you know, you, you, I, I could imagine, even online, saying such and such, we think such and such is a great product. We just happen to think ours is, you know, better than that price or mm -hmm. something. A little tongue in cheek and that's the sort of cheeky thing that might get the spread. Well and I mean especially, you know, putting back my former agency hat on, this is the stuff that agencies love, you know, to, to get creative with a beer campaign, to get cheeky, you know, it's all about persuasion and it's all about knowing your competition intimately and then how to leverage what's, what they've already put out there. So um, it, it all has to do, you know, with advertising, PR, branding, it's all, it's all mixed in there. Um, and what you do online should be directly comp and complement with, in directly in step with what you're doing offline as well. Uh, hi, Lisa. Uh, my question is related to like a new startup company. And um, if you put it up on a web, and um, how, how you would deal with a situation that um, like somebody put up a blog and that blog is actually maybe coming from your competition and they saying something bad and mm -hmm. they stay there for a long time mm -hmm. and uh, I experienced this one personally mm -hmm. actually and um, because most of the people they don't have a resource to do a bigger research about the company um, it's, um, it has a very high effect like negative effect mm -hmm. on the company and how you would fight that or what would you do? 
So it's, it's tough, um, specifically when you're in startup mode, to, you know, you're such, you're, sometimes, uh, the fact is, is that maybe you're an army of one, or at least a very lean team. So how are you supposed to track everything that everybody is saying about you? But in the instance where you have a big influencer saying something very negative about you, that's when the red flags have to come up. So um, I'll give you an example of someone asked me a similar question in another talk, and they said, you know, um, and I think it was GM, don't quote me on this, but GM put out a campaign that infuriated customers. And the, the question from the um, audience member, they said, you know, I'm not sure if, if the fact that they were on the social web was very positive because they got a huge negative backlash. So what I say to that is, you know, the fact is is that they had a huge backlash. They had a huge amount of people talking about them. And I think it was around, you know, they were saying that their such and such product was very green or very environmental and it, and it just didn't live up or something of that nature. Um, and you need to be able to be a little bit humble and say, okay, if it's true, you should attack it head on and say, wow, well, this is how I'm going to make it better. It's kind of like when you get caught red-handed. It's not so much the fact that you did it, we all screw up. It's the fact that, you know, after the fact, what are you going to do about it to make it better? And how are you going to tell your customers, this is what we're doing to directly address what happened? You know, companies go through can go through downfalls, can go through failure. You know, Maple Foods, how did they come back up off of such a huge crisis? Um, and there's a very good article in um, an edition of the Harvard Business Review. Um, it was, a, it, I think it, I believe it was the um, October or November edition all about innovation, it has a yellow cover. Anyway, it's all about how to recover from negative feedback and from crisis mode. But I would say that, you know, pick your battles, right? If it's, if it's, if it's not, and, and keep your finger on it. So if it's just a little bit of whisper, and you know that it's from competition, but it's not going to really negatively affect you anyway, then don't put time to it. But if you think that this is something that's going to, you know, if they're a hub, and they're going to say one thing that's going to proliferate to a large network, then you definitely should think about, you know, okay, Let's get strategic. I'm going to put some time and resources into dealing with this. And the best thing you could do is be authentic. If it's a lie, call them out. If it's true, say, you know, I'm sorry, this is what we're going to do to fix it. Audiences actually find that endearing, especially with a startup building trust. Is there such a thing as Web 3.0? And if so, how does it differ from 2.0? There is. I didn't think that we'd get into it today. But um, so the definition that I was um, using today with the social web um, and how it's basically how people are interacting online using Web 2.0 tools. Um, Web 3.0 is basically the progression of the social web, and some people are calling it the semantic web, and it's basically how all of these, all of this activity is going to turn into the next level of network. And the one of the major uh, players, I mean, it's kind of obvious. So Tim Berners Lee. If there's anybody that's a trip, that, that you can attribute the advent of the World Wide Web, it would be him. And he has created the World Wide Web Foundation. And they are really looking at the implications of the semantic web, how to make it one free web for all, how we can use it to our best capability. Um, so there's some interesting things going on in, in, in that respect. And, I'm not sure time-wise how quickly we're going to start seeing it, but they're certainly already launched, and definitely look into that. So it's the World Wide Web Foundation, and they're um, 
getting on the whole education train as well. Part of their component is to train people in web science and uh, really taking it next level and looking into Web 3.0. TED Talk. You can find anything on TED.com. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you, guys.